Royal expert Jonathan Sacerdoti helps us break down all the biggest revelations from volume two of Harry and Meghan's Netflix docuseries. I think the royal family wants to get on with doing what it does. I think that maybe they had hoped that when Meghan and Harry left the UK, it wouldn't just be a relief for them, it would be a relief for the family and they could all get on with doing the things they wanted. Plus, royal author Christopher Anderson weighs in on Harry and William's relationship moving forward after the Netflix doc. And now to see this, uh, see this seemingly irreparable rift is quite uh, shocking. Plus, Harry and Meghan won a royal summit as they announce a new Netflix project. Princess Kate hosts her Christmas concert and Prince William attends his ex-girlfriend's wedding. We've got that plus so much more in today's Royally Us. Hello to our fellow royal lovers and welcome to Royally Us. I'm Christina, that's Christine, and welcome to another big week of royal news. Um, you know, we had the last three episodes of the Netflix series for Harry and Meghan and, you know, definitely got a lot of people talking that wasn't boring <laughs> as opposed to I the mean, first ones. <laughs> we were just talking and neither one of us can believe that that was just within the last week that that happened. There right. has been so much um, to dive into in the Netflix series and some other stories this week. It feels like a lifetime ago. Um, but before we get into all of it, let's see what you guys had to say about last week's show. A lot of mixed reactions about the documentary. Alethea says... Kind of interesting to hear her talk about her dad getting paid to make himself look presentable and her and her husband getting paid to sell out their family and in-laws. Karma is on its way. Uh, interesting point. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of commentary about how they've made, you know, comments about like, you know, like dad getting paid to spit yeah. a certain way when they're sort of also being paid to look yeah. a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's invalid criticism, although maybe, you know, sometimes it could be kinder. <laughs> right. Yes. <Yeah. laughs> but I agree. Yes, it, it's definitely a valid point. Um, yeah. Vanessa says, let's accuse, uh, let's accuse everyone else except the palace. Megan was and still shredded to pieces by the tabloids and none seemed to care about about her and don't tell me it's because of her doing the moment the story broke that she was dating harry i went to her instagram page before she closed it man people were insulting her calling her names like she killed a person i support her and i hope she will keep standing up for herself i mean you can't deny that the british media have been absolutely ruthless and terrible to her they really have i i know and a lot of you know there's so many troll accounts on the internet especially on instagram and twitter you see some really, really ugly parts of human nature when you see comments like those. Definitely. And Judy says, I wonder what they're trying to achieve in the end. It's so sad, really. I mean, that's a question that I think a lot of people have. What is their end game? And, you know, what are they hoping to accomplish? And, you know, we just hope that maybe after the book comes out, like we said, this chapter will close and, you know, everybody can kind of move on. But we'll have to wait and see. Yep, totally agree with Judy there. I don't know where they're trying to go. <laughs> Don't, definitely not. All right. Well, let's get into our royal roundup. And before we discuss uh, Harry and Meghan's documentary, let's see what other members of the royal family were up to. The Prince and Princess of Wales, uh, or the Princess of Wales, was, was joined by her husband, Prince William, and their children, Prince George and Princess Charlotte, for her second annual Christmas concert, Royal Carols Together at Christmas. Now, this was a taping because this, of course, airs on Christmas Eve, I believe, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, Arizona Christmas Eve. Definitely. Well, the special event took place, it looked absolutely beautiful, at Westminster Abbey in London on December 15th. King Charles, Queen Consort Camilla, and um, a few other members of the royal families were there. And it, like I said, it looked absolutely beautiful. They, um, It seemed like a really nice event. It was. I, there, it was just spectacular. There were tons and tons of Christmas trees, which were donated by King Charles from the Windsor Park Estate. And those Christmas trees are then going to be donated to um, causes in need that might need a Christmas tree to celebrate this season. So I thought that was another really lovely touch. But it was such an incredible show of unity from the royal family. You had pretty much every member of the royal family from like high ranking, you know, the king and queen, mm -hmm. all the way down to like lesser known members of the royal family. Everyone was there um, in their sort of festive finest. I loved seeing Kate's family were there. Her mom and dad and her sister and husband were um, in attendance. I think it was just, an, I'm so excited to watch because it looks like so much fun. It definitely does. And I love the moment that got a lot of people talking was uh, Princess uh, Kate's perfect curtsy to King Charles. Is that uh, this moment definitely went viral? <laughs> I love this. It's so, it's very princess perfect. It's so, mm -hmm. you know, polished, you know, she's practiced in front of the yes. mirror. But it is this sort of weird thing where you're kissing him on the cheek and then curtsying to him. Right. It's like you're she's so familiar with him, but he's still the king of England, you know, of the United Kingdom. What a strange sort of um, dynamic that must be. It really is. But 
Yeah, I loved this. I loved she met with a little boy called Theo, who she had met earlier uh, this year in Wales. Theo had given her flowers on a visit to Wales shortly after the Queen's death. And Theo and his parents were invited to the Carol concert to see them again. I loved that story. I love that so much. I love that. And, you know, of course, they sang Christmas carols. There were performances by Craig David, Spice Girl Mel C, which I love. Um, (laughs) And there were you know, Prince William spoke um, and there was a Paddington bear um, nod because, of course, this was there was a lot of references to Queen Elizabeth. She was honored at the Christmas concert. And in the program, it actually read this carol service is dedicated to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and to all those who are sadly no longer with us. Her late majesty's strongly held value values of duty, compassion and faith have guided the creation of this service. Like I said, Prince William, he gave an uplifting speech about the holidays, and he actually read um, one of the late Queen's previous Christmas speeches from 2012, and it said, at Christmas, I am always struck by how the spirit of togetherness lies also at the heart of the Christmas story. A young mother and a dutiful father with their baby were joined by poor shepherds and visitors from afar. They came with their gifts to worship the Christ child. From that day on, he has inspired people to commit themselves to the best interests of others. Um, I love this. I love that, you know, obviously she's going to be sorely missed this holiday season, but it was nice of them to add some personal touches and um, her words and the Paddington Bear tribute as well, which I thought was great. I love that the queen has become sort of synonymous with Paddington. Um <laughs> It's such a special, you know, two very, very British icons. It's really Mm -hmm. special that they can kind of, you know, carry on that meaning together. But yeah, it's been, I'm sure it'll be hugely emotional, I think, between the Carol concert and all the tributes Mm -hmm. to Queen Elizabeth and sort of another reminder that she's no longer here, you know, another Christmas event, Christmas year where we won't, um, we won't see her anymore. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, Prince William was busy this week. He also attended the wedding of his first serious girlfriend, Rose Farquhar. Uh, She got married to George Gemmell on Saturday, December 17th. He was photographed discreetly arriving via a back entrance of the church at um of saint mary the virgin in gloucestershire england um princess kate was not in attendance but he dated uh, rose back in 2000 they met at uh the beautiful polo club in gloucestershire after the prince finished his a levels at eton college this was before he met um kate middleton but obviously they remain on good terms often crossing paths with some childhood friends and things like that so nice to see that he is uh still in good uh <laughs> Good contact with some of his old girlfriends and his old friends, I'm sure, as well. I I think this must have been so much fun. I mean, you have to think this would have been when William was like 16, 17. I don't think it was, you know, I don't think there were any wedding bells. Um, I mean, you say that, but he met Kate only a few years later. But this was a big um, wedding for a lot of their friends. It must have been a great reunion, especially, you know, after after so many years of the pandemic, these big celebrations are extra special. And the bride looked so beautiful. You absolutely have to go look up her what she looked like. She looked incredible. And I think it was great that William was there to support his friends. Definitely. I love it so much. Well, um, Buckingham Palace revealed that Lady Suzanne Hussey met with Ngozi Fellaini, uh, the founder of the charity system space, to address the incident that took place at the uh, palace reception last month. In a statement, Buckingham Palace released saying, at this meeting filled with warmth and understanding, Lady Suzanne offered her sincere apologies for the comments that were made and the distress that caused Miss Fellaini. Lady Suzanne has pledged to deepen her awareness of the sensitivities involved and is grateful for the opportunity to learn more about the issues in this area. Miss Fellaini, who has unfairly received the most appalling torrent of abuse on social media and elsewhere, has accepted this apology and appreciates that no malice was intended. Um, you know, Fellaini, of course, she said that she was repeatedly asked racially loaded questions about her heritage and background by Lady Suzanne and Hussey. And um, this was, of course, at a November event. They're hoping that they can all kind of move forward after this and move on. And it seems like the two ladies had a discussion and came to an understanding and they're moving on. So they're hoping that everybody else can too. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a really lovely human um, experience that they've shared with the public where, mm-hmm. you know, this 
older woman was not well educated. Um, someone took the time to educate her and they were able to sort of learn from it and, um, you know, move forward. Like we said, I thought that that was great that Miss Filani took that opportunity, not just to educate the Queen's former lady in waiting, but so many people who've now heard this story and now understand better. And I think this was a really powerful example of the palace learning from past mistakes mm -hmm. and making changes. I mean, this, they didn't sweep this under the rug. You know, right. this statement shows that they didn't sweep this under the rug and hope it went away. Mm -hmm. They actually took action to mm -hmm. um teach the staff really teach the public in, in this circumstance and and try and rectify the situation as much yeah. as possible yeah no i agree with you it's nice to see them take that extra step not just you know obviously she resigned from the position they released right. a statement apologizing but it's nice to see them taking that extra step forward and yeah. you know educating and learning from the mistakes that were made so like we said, hopefully everybody can move on from this one and, um, you know, like we said, learn from it. All right. Well, moving on to King Charles, he visited JW3, a Jewish community center in North London that welcomes all face. Uh, the sovereign was stopped by to learn more about the rich programming at the hub and spend time with people who make it special. He toured JW3 before Hanukkah uh, began and kicked off the visit by connecting with local students, wrapping gifts, things like that. He also attended an early Hanukkah party hosted annually for Holocaust survivors where he showed off some dance moves. I always love seeing um, the royal family show off some some dance moves. It's always fun. <laughs> I know. And he really got into it. He wasn't yeah. just, you know, awkwardly booking. He was dancing. <laughs> he was full on dancing, really yeah. getting into it. <laughs> Such a great moment. I think there's been so much discussion, especially now that King Charles has become king, mm -hmm. how he can still represent the British people and be a defender of the faith, you know, the, the Church of England faith. And it really, he's really done a lot in the last couple of weeks to show that he wants to learn more and support all of the faiths throughout mm -hmm. the United Kingdom. And this was such a fun example of that. I thought this was just so much fun to see King Charles dancing at the... Yeah, <laughs> it was <laughs> nice that he was letting loose as, you know, yes. Harry and Meghan were kind of <laughs> dropping these bombshells on us. So let's get into um, the royalty and talk about the this documentary, the final three episodes. Obviously, the first three episodes was a lot of their backstory, their love story, but this really kind of got into some of the nitty gritty of what went down when they left the royal family and a lot of shocking revelations. Um, you know, I thought it was interesting. It seemed like the, the um, a lot of his problem lies with his brother, which is kind of surprising. Yeah. Like, yeah. his, uh, you know, William's office turning on him, which, you know, they made a pact to never, you know, uh, talk badly about each other in the press. And that's what happened. And it seems like that's really what got things going. Yeah, I, I think that it is interesting. It, it became clear that a lot of the friction within the family is between Harry and William. Yeah. Um, and I I think we have to consider, you know, the, the teams that run all of these households are pretty big. I mean, you yeah. know, there's a lot of people involved in this. Um, a lot of politics within these departments, within these households. And I just think that it's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, a lot ultimately, of you know, these decisions. No. But yeah, this started with, you know, William and Harry making a decision together. And then William's team sort of moves forward and releases a statement that Harry was like, I, whoa, 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 we said we weren't going to do this. Right. And that's yeah. really difficult because there's no way, was that William? Was that his direct press secretary? Was that who his secretary reports to? There's so many people involved and we'll never hear the other side of the story. So we don't really know what happened there, but it's clearly where this rift started. Yeah. It was also interesting how, you know, Harry and Megan had all these plans, you know, that they were going to move to South Africa. They they gave them all these options about moving to Canada, things like that. And every time these plans got leaked, which was really interesting, it seemed like the South Africa trip, or at least the move, was pretty much a go until that was leaked to the press, pretty much asking if this was a good thing or not. And, you know, you, you do feel bad because they did try to make something work. They really did. They did not want to be a hundred percent out of this family. And it really did seem like they, I mean, yes, a lot of people can argue that they wanted their cake and they wanted to eat it too, but you know, they really wanted to make something work and, you know, just dealing with the incessant hounding from the press, it really, really got to them. It seemed like. Yeah. I think between their, you know, the relationship with the press that where they had a terrible relationship yeah. with the press mm -hmm. and sort of their, huge mistrust of the way the royal household works yeah. and maybe 
you know, they didn't like the way that the royal household works, mm-hmm. you're not going to change a thousand year old institution yeah. of which you aren't in charge of. Mm-hmm. Um, this was probably the only solution that wasn't going to cause more discourse. I mean, if we can imagine an alternative that was more, <laughs> you know, more fractious than it already is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do think it was interesting. Every sort of plan that they had, you know, ended up leaking to the press and, mm-hmm. It, you do have to question who was doing that and how much does the royal family know. And again, we don't know. And there's so many people that could have leaked this. I mean, there's got at least half a dozen, if not more. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really, it, it's unlikely that we would be able to say it was definitely Charles you know, who called up the editor and leaked this. Right. Um, it's such a difficult situation. And I feel so much of what they said, a lot of what they said, I was really left thinking, well, what, what would the other side say yeah. here? What actually happened? And, you know, when you only get one side of the story, it's difficult to know what to believe. It's so true. And then, you know, we, he broke down what happened at that Sandringham summit where he and William got into a shouting match. Uh, King Charles said some things that were untrue. Yeah. But like you said, it's, it's hard to know, um, you know, there's three sides to a story, one person's truth, the other person's truth and the actual truth. So I guess we'll, we'll never really know because like you said, they're never going to explain their side and they're seeming to ignore everything that's going on, going on in this documentary. You know, the only rebuttal we got was from Jason Knopf who said that Prince William did not tell him to give this witness statement in the, in Megan's trial. And, you know, they went back and forth about that, but I don't think we're ever going to get an answer from the royal family. No, and I, I think a problem that Meghan and Harry have, and I hope it doesn't fester, is that, you know, they made this grand statement, the royal family declined to comment. Then there was this back and forth, yes, they did, no, they didn't, yes, they did. And then you have Jason Nauf saying, no, I never did that. And then the, again, there was that back and forth. And now you're sort of thinking, okay, how many other things are maybe not true? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I was, I've said, it, you know, so many times my concern is that any holes in their story are going to be picked apart and are really going to take away from their ultimate message. Yeah, no. And and I guess the ultimate message is love wins. I mean, I guess that's what they're yeah, really yeah. trying to to pull here. But like you'll see in our interview with Christopher, like he, you know, he makes a good point. Like you want to end it with love wins, but then you're trying to get the last word with that you know, that mention on screen from Jason and, you know, going back, you want to get that final word that like, you know, you're above the Royal family. It seems like, I don't know. Yes. You, they seem very much in love. They seem very happy together in their life in California, but it is suspect that cameras were rolling at all times. Of course, when that Prince William text came through and being like, Oh, look at this. And like, we don't know what he said. It's just, it's it's interesting how cameras were rolling for just so long. I don't know. I don't know. I, I but I do appreciate their love story. It seems like they are very much in love. I, you know, I I feel for her that she was, you know, with the death threats, it's disgusting. I mean, we're even seeing it now with um Jeremy Clarkson, you know, speaking out in the sun, you know, she said that all she did was get these death threats and things like that and then it just continues. It's like let's give the girl a break. So mm-hmm. in that regard, I do feel for them, but I just don't understand their end game, you know, with taking down the family. I, I agree with you. I think they look so in love. They look like such a happy family. And I think they could do so much good with their yeah. platform mm-hmm. if they would just close the book on this and move on. And I yes. know it would be difficult. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you do feel like you have to have your side heard. But I think at this point, between the Netflix series, the mm-hmm. book, the magazine features, surely they, there has to come a point where you have said your piece. Yes. And I think a lot of us are saying, okay, now it's time to move on. And we want to see what amazing things you can do from here. Exactly. Um, so like we said, we talked about Jason and a lot of people were wondering, could Prince William ha- had sign off on this? So we wanted to get Christopher Anderson's take on this and where Harry and William kind of go from here. Take a look. Yeah, I know this one's going to get a lot of people talking and especially, you know, the whole legal drama with Megan and the Daily Mail and then yeah. the witness statement from Jason right. um, and that having tied to Prince William. Like, that's a big accusation. It is. And, you know, isn't it interesting in the documentary, they uh, have this they wind up in, with this kind of uh, of this wonderful narrative. You know, she says it's a modern fairy tale. And uh, Harry, Harry says we've made it to the other side. A very sweet ending, an ending to a great love story. But then there's a disclaimer after that, in which they rehash the whole thing. You know, did 
you know, William's uh, secretary denies that he ever issued this, you know, ever leaked this information. And then the Sussexes get the final word when their lawyers say, in fact, or they they issue a formal statement saying, oh, no, we never authorized him to, to issue this information. So it's another swipe at, at William. And it makes it rather obvious that um, the tensions between William, I think they're, they're not just simmering or festering anymore. I mean, I think this is a, uh, just a chasm that isn't going to be breached at any time soon. Yeah, no, then, it, was, it was interesting that they decided to put that disclaimer at the end and not yeah. as a button to that story um, right. when they were talking about it previously. So like you said, yeah, they try to definitely get the last word in. And it seems like the tension is more so between Harry and William and not so much Harry and King Charles, as many probably thought. Right. Although I think that any attack on William is going to be seen, uh, you know, because William is the heir, is going to be seen as an attack on the monarchy and an attack on Charles. And Charles is the person who's got to keep this whole thing together. You know, if this uh, dog and pony show known as the monarchy is going to continue to thrive, uh, it's going to be, it's only going to be because of Charles's ability to navigate all of this. If he can't, uh, I think they're in real trouble. Mm -hmm. It's very, very damaging to the reputation of the monarchy. Right. Do you feel like William had anything to do with uh, Jason giving that witness statement? Or do you, I mean, that's, it's a, that's a very tricky path to go down. It is. I mean, my, my guess is it would have had to have been approved by him because it is a fundamentally uh, an attempt to, uh, you know, uh, undercut his brother mm -hmm. and his brother's wife. So I, I can't see how that kind of statement could have been made without uh, William approval. So, I mean, do you think that Harry's problem still is with, you know, the firm or the institution side of things, or is it with this, his family, or is it a little bit of both? I found it interesting also that he, William, and Charles all had an agreement that their um, press offices would never go after one another. And it seems like once that trust was broken, a lot of the cracks started to show. Right, exactly. And uh, yeah, it is, it's a combination. I mean, they're interwoven, they're intertwined. There's no way to really separate the family from the firm. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was, who was it? Was it Tyler Perry who said it was a question? No, I guess it was Megan who said that it was a uh, situation where the the firm was, uh, uh, the, the family was being uh, destroyed by the family firm. Mm -hmm. I think the way she phrased it, it was inaccurate. I mean, because the family firm is everything, of course. It's, and, and again, you've got to remember, it's they're this, they are the living, breathing embodiment of the state. So right. they really have a lot on their shoulders. Especially mm -hmm. the mom. Yeah. It was interesting. He said when he went back to um, for Prince Philip's funeral that they also had conversations at that point, which we've rep we reported back at the time. But it's interesting that he felt at that time that no one was ever going to take genuine accountability or have a genuine apology. I mean, do we know any of like what those inner workings of those conversations were like and have they had any conversations since? I don't believe they've had any conversations yeah. since, uh, uh, with, except for the past, the, the, passing uh, niceties they would have had at the Queen's funeral right. when they were mm -hmm. the together. Uh, yeah, the, 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 I did describe in in my in the, in, uh, the King right. uh, the meeting uh, and, and how uh, formal it was, rigid it was, and how everyone seemed to be holding to their positions and they weren't getting anywhere. And it was ha held a kind of a very offhand, matter of fact, get together right after uh, the kind of very touching uh, funeral service during the height of COVID. Uh, for uh, Prince Philip, and the Queen was left there all alone, sitting in a pew. Um, but if anybody had hoped that there would be some sort of, and, and by, by the way, the uh, chance for reconciliation really was pushed by Kate. You do remember that right. while she walked up the hill from the funeral service toward Windsor Castle, you know, it was Kate who kind of maneuvered herself so the two brothers could be together. Because I think she, more than anyone else at that time, uh, wanted to, to have some sort of reconciliation to take place. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to watch this and be like, why couldn't they just come to some sort of resolution? Why didn't the royal family just allow them to move to Canada, do what they wanted to do, have half in, half out, move to South Africa, be half in, half out, and still honor and work for the queen? I mean, why don't you think the, they just kind of gave into that? It's just a rigid system, and, it, yeah. and I don't think there's any... Um imagination there. I mean, of course, they had a, in, in uh, Megan, they had a valuable asset. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about the Commonwealth, as they pointed out, a third of the world's population belongs to the Commonwealth, mostly people of color. Obviously, she's a uh, terribly charismatic person and warm person and uh, would have been a perfect 
uh, ambassador for the uh, monarchy. But uh, no rules are rules, you know, and that's how the senior, uh, uh, you'd think younger uh, bureaucrats there would see the wisdom inherent in this, but apparently they didn't. Yeah, well, I mean, he said that probably Prince William had to sign off on it. I mean, I'm sure that they do have to go to the top to at least let their boss know what is going on. I'm, I'm So who knows? Like you said, we're, we're never going get, um, to get the answers. But following the docuseries, the Sunday Times issued a report saying that Meghan and Harry are pushing for a sit down with the royal family to make the first peace offering and recognize they were wrong. They feel the royal family has shown double standards by instigating a reconciliation between um, Ngozi Fellaini and uh, Lady Suzanne Hussey, which we talked about earlier. Now, a source told The Times if they want to get in touch with the king, they know where he lives. Well, friends of the Prince of Wales uh, told the publication things have been very strained for a while. There is sadness at where things currently are with his brother. And there's, of course, the memoir coming. Um, I don't think that this sit down is going to happen anytime soon. No, no. I didn't <laughs> have the, they know where he lives. We all know where the king lives. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, I think I, I thought that. I thought of this too when I heard about the meeting with um, Ngozi Fulani, but I think it's a it's a good example of learning from past mistakes and moving forward, mm -hmm. and um, also a sign of the new reign. You know, we have King Charles as the sovereign now. Previously, it was obviously Queen Elizabeth who mm -hmm. ran the monarchy very differently, and so I think we can only move forward from here. And there's so much discourse there's so much friction within this family i don't think that they really want to circle yeah. back no. there's a lot of hurt feelings that i think are going to take a long time to heal and now we have a memoir that's just going to dig them all back up i know it's like we needed a little break from this but yeah. it's, it's good to come in well to break help us break down uh, harry and harry and megan's documentary even more and what the royal family thinks about all this we caught up with uh jonathan sacerdoti and of course a little bit more from our interview with christopher take a look do you feel like this when the royal family, if the royal family is watching this, I mean, what do you think their reaction is? Rage. I, I mean, you know, look, uh, again, Harry talks about the, the, the he almost matter of factly talks about how his brother was shouting and mm -hmm. screaming at him during this meeting uh, and, ter and terrorizing, I think was the phrase used. And um, and so, you know, Harry has, um, William has a tremendous temper. Charles has a tremendous temper. Uh, you know, it's just not going to be a pretty sight there. And of course, there's more to come with the book. I mean, they must really, this is just a walk up to whatever is in that, in that book. Um, but I thought the whole thing was quite fascinating. Actually. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like this pushes the Royal family into a corner to finally say something? Or do you think that they're just hoping this all blows over? Well, you know, we, we're looking at the coronation coming up. I would have, I would have said, I have the impression that they would be invited to the coronation and they would certainly attend. Now I'm beginning to wonder, you know, whether they, they would even go if they were invited. They're they're going a long way to really severing all ties with the royals, I think. And um, uh, you know, once again, um, you wouldn't blame the royal family, especially the the new king, for mm -hmm. being. Uh, furious at the kind of uh, disruption this is all causing. Yeah, it seems like this. It seems like there's no coming back after this. I don't think so. And you know, I mean, yes, it's a love story, and there are wonderful moments. But the creepy part about it, as far as I'm concerned, is that um, you know who is taking all this footage? Private. Moments, you know, the, uh, you know there, there they are after they're doing their kind of their farewell uh, uh, tour, and they're in their kitchen in in in, uh, in, in uh, Kensington Palace, and uh, and and she hops up on a counter, and there's a great photograph of the two. Of, who is taking that picture? Who is taking all the footage of them over these last several years? You, you just have to feel that there's an odd. You know, if for, it seems to me that these are two people who really crave attention, who crave the spotlight, who want to have history told only from their vantage point, and uh, you know, I, I think um, uh, some people will see it as heartwarming, I suppose, but I see it as really um, an attempt to, you know, uh, in in some ways, um, I don't think he's in, well, again. Um, it's going to be very damaging for the monarchy, let's put it that way. And yeah. the family. 
So, I mean, since we only heard one side, do you think that this, I mean, it's never going to force the Royal family to say anything, but do you feel like they should respond? I mean, I know it's never complain, never explain, but do you feel like they're kind of backed into a corner at this point to say something? I just don't know. I think the Royal family wants to get on with doing what it does. I think that maybe they had hoped that when Meghan and Harry left the UK, it wouldn't just be a relief for them. It would be a relief for the family and they could all get on with doing the things they wanted. They'd made that valid decision that they didn't want to be part of it. But that just hasn't happened. It's the opposite. They keep raking over all of this stuff and they keep bringing it back up again. It seems a bit like they have a vendetta against the family. And I think the last three episodes gave something of a justification for why they feel that's okay, why they've got that vendetta. But it doesn't really hide the fact that they have and that they're making these constant attacks. And it's very hard to forget that they're doing that for massive amounts of money. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't look good, I think. On the other hand, the royal family came out of this, if you took it at face value, as as heartless and cold towards them and placing the importance of the uh, massive historic uh, symbolism of the family ahead of the personal relations with them, which I think is probably what we all knew happens, that that's what the royal family is. So I think the royal family probably will have to respond in some small ways to individual bits, just like Prince William did back when he said it's very much not a racist family. And the late Queen issued a, a brief statement after that big interview right. originally. Um, so I think they may have something similar or they may just try very hard to carry on going and, and wait for the next grenade to be lobbed their way from Montecito and and just put up with it as long as they possibly can with the hope that maybe people's interest will wane. Well, we were wondering what they were, uh, Harry and Meghan were going to do next, and they they let us know. They have a new Netflix project called The Live to Lead, which is about extraordinary leaders reflecting on their legacies and share messages of courage, compassion, humility, hope, and generosity. So this is inspired by the iconic legacy of Nelson Mandela, and it is going to be hi- highlighting um, many different people, including the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, climate change activist Greta Thunberg, and um, so many other um, people, including feminist activist Gloria Steinem, it premieres on December 31st. So, I mean, you know, they are taking over Netflix. (laughs) Yeah, I think this is an amazing project. You know, we we learned that it was originally a project um, produced by the Mandela Foundation, obviously because, you know, people (laughs) like Ruth Bader Ginsburg has since died. All right. of this was filmed way back in 2019. Mm-hmm. Before the Sussex has signed on, they've now signed on to as executive producers. They sort of host the series. So it's another, again, it's a great project that they can use their platform to promote, mm-hmm. um, which is a really powerful thing. Definitely very, very powerful. All right. Well, let's get into our pint sized palace before we wrap things up. And, you know, we saw a little bit more of the home life of Archie and Lily in the docuseries. What do you think about Tyler Perry being Lily's godfather? It really makes me wonder who else her godparents are. It's right. Just, it must be such a star-studded lineup. Even, mm-hmm. you know, we don't know much about Archie's godparents. And I would love to know just who's part of their their yeah. family, you know, the village that's raising them. I think it's just a fun, fun to hear about. Oh, very I fun. Think, yeah, I loved all the photos though they were so relatable um there were some really sweet ones especially when megan was pregnant yeah no i wonder i really wonder who archie's godmother is like she because at the time she was very still very close with jessica mulroney who was very noticeably absent from the docuseries because it seems like they you know obviously had a falling out so um but it is interesting to see her inner circle yeah, very, very interesting about they've become so private with their private mm-hmm. lives. It's been really interesting just to catch a glimpse inside. Yeah. And we got to give a little shout out to George and Charlotte at the Christmas concert because I love their matching <laughs> moments with their with their parents. They look so they great. So mm-hmm. cute. So well behaved. And I thought about little Louis at home in his pajamas. <laughs> Poor Louis. Maybe next year, Louis. <laughs> I, we <laughs> might see him on Christmas Day. I think that that would be wonderful. But as someone who just took a four, almost five-year-old to um, a Christmas Carol concert. Louis was better off at home. <laughs> right, 100%. I totally yeah. agree. <laughs> All right, well, that is it for this week's episode of Royal Death. Please let us know in the comments your thoughts on Harry and Meghan's docuseries, because I'm sure you guys have a lot to say about it, as we did. But keep commenting, keep subscribing, and make sure to tune in next week as we recap the biggest royal stories of the year. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. For more news content and exclusive interviews, make sure to hit the sub, like, and bell button down below and visit usmagazine.com.